right, guys, we're on the Fearless Pursuit of Freedom podcast, and today's host, or I'm your host, Brandon Richards, and my guest today is the uh, president of People of Peru Project. And, you know, this, you guys all know that I was in Peru this past couple of weeks, and uh, I learned a lot, and it was a very eye opening trip for me. So I wanted to bring on uh, Paul up here to, you know, explain how he went from being an entrepreneur, chopping some trees, running a mill shop, and selling some cars to dropping everything and starting this thing down in Peru. So uh, please welcome my guest, Paul, here. Good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, Yeah, so Paul, you know, like before the show, I I come on it. I thought your story was amazing. You know, 18 years ago, you dropped everything. Well, 14 years ago, you dropped everything and moved down to Peru full time. And I just want more people to hear about your story and what you're doing down there for the people. And I'll hand it over to you because you're a good storyteller. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, Brandon, and, and uh, appreciate the the support that you and the seven other riders gave us on this trip. And I'll just fast forward to the end of that and say, you know, because of the riders that went with us in the Andes Mountains for those 10 days, uh, there are... Uh, eight additional impoverished children now that will attend school that we'll be sponsoring uh, as, a, as a part of that benefit ride. So thank you for that. And obviously that's what brought us together on a friendship level here. So it's, it's all good. I really have enjoyed it. The beauty of this is I've seen it happen over 5,000 times now. Over the last 14 years, we've had that many volunteers who have essentially laid aside their day-to-day responsibilities and have uh, come to us either out of their abundance at times or uh, in many cases out of their sacrifice to impact the lives of of the impoverished people that we work with. So volunteers have been the lifeblood of our work. They've brought their expertise, their passion, and, um, and their enthusiasm to to the work we're doing up in Iquitos. Mm -hmm. So that's the end. I'll start back at the beginning. In March of 2000, my daughter had been invited along on a school-sponsored service trip to Iquitos, Peru. Now, Iquitos is a unique city in that it's the largest city on earth that you can't drive to. You, You have to go in by boat or by plane. In the middle of the Amazon jungle, it's at the headwaters of the Amazon River. Uh, If you follow the Amazon River in on your atlas from the east coast of South America, you will end up in Iquitos, right at the headwaters. So very, very unique. The city was built in the 1800s out of the the rubber baron industry. It became the port city as they were exporting the rubber from the Amazon uh, rainforest there. And that's what really boosted that city to begin with. Eventually, uh, when the rubber industry died out, the exotic hardwood timber industry took over and a lot of millionaires came out of there because of timber exports. Mm-hmm. And then um, tourism by that time was was getting big and, and what dovetailed on top of tourism was the oil exploration up until just recently, until the price per barrel dropped so much that they can't afford to get it out of the Amazon. But that's where our city came from. And so right now what we have is three quarters of a million people living in the middle of the largest Amazon jungle in the, in, in the world, the lungs of, of the world right there that are producing more oxygen than uh, anywhere else because we're in the middle of that rainforest. When you leave Lima, you're actually leaving the longest arid, arid coastline in the world. You fly up over the top of the longest mountain range in the world, which would be the Andes, and then you land in the largest city in the world with no roads leading to it and uh, in the middle of a long, our largest rainforest in the world. So we got a lot of Guinness Book of World Record things right there in one yeah, flight. That's awesome. Very cool. <laughs> so we're just a few hundred feet above sea level. Um, oxygen rich, you know, altogether different than some of the places where you and I just spent the last uh, two weeks up at 16,000 feet in the Andes. So very, very different. Culture is very different. Uh, transient jungle Indians lived in the surrounding area. Very, very different than the Inca culture that built permanent dwelling places out of stone where it took them years and years to build. Uh, the, the jungle Indians are very different. <clears throat> they hunted, gathered, fished, and moved on to better grounds later on. So uh, just a very different culture, a very different mentality. But the the cultural uniqueness of that city has been um, – has been, uh, preserved very well because 
so many of the folks have never left there. It's like an island. And if you, if you have to go out by four days by boat or an hour and a half commercial 737 flight, that's a long way. So there's just lots of people yeah. that never leave. So in March of 2000, my daughter was invited to go along. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. We started talking about those kind of trips back in my former life when I was a teacher right out of college. And I worked at some uh, private schools. Uh, we did take those same type of service trips. And we were talking about, I was talking to my daughter who was 15 at the time, turned 16 in Peru, how much I liked the Latino culture, how much I loved Mexico when we went there with groups of students, and we were just talking about that. And my daughter said to me at the end of that conversation, hey, Dad, you should go with me to to Peru. They're looking for parents to go along. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I told my wife later, you know, between you and me and everybody listening, I said, I think she was just being polite. I'm not really sure what teenage daughter wants their dad going along on a school-sponsored trip. Right. But she was, <laughs> she was sincere. And so I went and because I didn't really have a lot of responsibilities, I uh, did a lot of wandering around. I met some people that spoke English. It's a Spanish speaking uh, country, even though Quechua is still the official language of the country and spoken up in the mountains and the remote regions. Uh, Spanish obviously is the dominant language and I didn't speak any Spanish. So I found a couple of people that did and they hauled me around for 10 days to the the, the parts of the city that I kept asking them, you know, take me to the place where the tourists don't go. And yeah. that he did. I saw tremendous poverty. I saw suffering on levels that I had never seen before. I saw children that were uncared for, old people that had no access whatsoever to medical care of any kind, people that were nutritionally depleted. Um, you know, it was, it was like a, a 10 day, infomercial for poverty and it really affected me profoundly and I think um, at some point I knew that I would come back and toward the end of the trip I, I told a few people I would come back to see what I could do to help and that's really where it began I, I made a commitment to some people said yeah I'll be back and so um, it was a full year and and I went back in March of 2001 <clears throat> by myself uh, met up with uh, these two men that I had met that both spoke English, and we just simply started scanning the the, the poverty uh, infested areas outside the city for people that genuinely needed help. And it was a it's kind of a no brainer, you know. Some people think, man, how do you know you're not being taken advantage of? How do you know people are telling you the truth? You know, what what kind of vetting process did you have? Yeah. But, but this was so simple back then. I mean, it's no brainer. Anybody could do what I did. Anybody could do it. Um, we, we just went into communities and just started talking to people and eventually said, Oh, you know, do you know of anybody that's really sick or somebody that's having a particularly hard time right now? And the people within the community identified the people that really needed help. So they weren't saying me, me, they were saying, Oh yeah, my neighbor, uh, you know, he's had this infection in his leg for, several months and has no money for medicine or so-and-so is burning up with fever or, or this child has not been well for a year, or, you know, just that kind of thing. It was easy. Yeah. Uh, particularly the dental work. I mean, you don't have to be a dentist to look in somebody's mouth and see big gaping black holes that used to be teeth, you know, that um, uh, people whose mouths we say in the, in the dental arena there, we say whose mouths have blown up. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a no brainer. I just took these people to private hospitals and, and clinics and dental facilities and just paid for their services. I mean, nobody, nobody fakes a gallbladder surgery because they're trying to get your money. Right. You know, they, they either need the help or they don't need the help. And it was very, very evident and, and just easy. There's no reason that anybody couldn't do that with a little resource. And um, what, had, what had made me decide in 2000 that I could probably do this was a conversation that we'd had with a uh, with a man just stopped talking to this middle-aged guy down there in the slums and just asking him questions about his life uh, where he lived and how many kids he had and just you know what he did for work and that kind of thing and my translator got real serious at the time and he he, he stopped and he kind of paused and he looked at me and he said wow this guy's wife's really sick matter of fact she's dying 
And I said, Oh, wow. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm sorry to hear that. What's, what's happened. And so they talked a little bit more and he says to me, well, it's, it's cancer. His wife has cancer. I said, Oh man, I'm so sorry. You know, I, my, my condolences, I, I, I feel so bad. And the conversation continued a little bit. And, and I, I, I don't know why really that I felt compelled to ask what kind of cancer, maybe just curiosity, maybe kind of a little divine nudge. I'm not really sure, but I asked and the guy said, uh, maybe I was actually, maybe I was more curious as to whether or not he even knew what kind of cancer. I don't know. It seems so primitive that, that, a, a, a positive specific diagnosis seemed a little bit, you know, over the top to me. So I was just, maybe I was curious. I'm not sure, but, yeah. but I asked what kind of cancer and he knew right away. He said, uh, she's got, um, uterine cancer, uh, cancer of the uterus. I said, well, wow. You know, that's horrible. But I, I said to this translator friend of mine, I said, man, that's kind of one of the easier ones to take care of. If, um, you know, or I say uteral cancer, sorry, uh, cervical cancer. I said, that's one of the easier ones to take care of if you, you know, if you can get on that right away. I mean, I wonder how long they've known. I wonder what kind of symptoms she's having. I wonder if it's too late because for, um, for a cervical cancer, they usually, um, you know, a hysterectomy can get ahead of the cancer and, and yes, you'll not have any more children, but you'll live. And so I said to them, you know, I said, well, you know, how, do, how do you know, specifically and he said well he had it diagnosed and I asked him um you know uh, I said well then why don't you have that hysterectomy done and and uh, get ahead of this thing and he just looked at me like I was a unicorn you know just absolute blank stare disbelief like I would even ask why why aren't you doing this and he said "I, I have no money and I was pretty naive at the time. And I said, yeah, but if you go to the hospital and if they see that there's a cancer situation, if they see there's a life that can be saved through a simple surgery, surely they'll do that. And bo- and then both he and my translator looked at me like I was a unicorn and said, oh, no, that's not the way it works here. If you don't have the money to pay, you simply will will die of your condition. And, and it really hit me, you know, like a ton of bricks. I, I just, wow. You know, I mean tragic. Um, you know, I lost my mom to cancer two years ago, but in the meantime, we did everything medically possible to, um, to give her, uh, a long as lifespan as possible. And then at the same time, you know, the, the pain, um, control as the, as the, as the disease progressed. And so she was as well taken care of as modern science, um, knows today to take care of somebody. But, but this guy was telling me, yeah, not only do we know for sure she's going to die of cancer, there's really, really nothing that they're going to do for in the meantime. And that's just a horrible uh, thought, horrible death. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I was a bit tongue tied there for a while and I didn't really know what to say. And I finally said, well, uh, I said to, to my friend, uh, translator, I said, well, how, you know, what, what, what does it cost to do a hysterectomy? And I mean, does he have any idea? And he asked him and the guy said, oh yeah, I know exactly what it'll cost. And I said, well, what's that cost? And he, uh, he told him and then uh, my friend kind of figured that out, did a little air math in his head there. And he said, yeah, it's about $350 doing the conversion between the local currency and, and, and dollars. And I said, no, 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 I don't, you know, I, I mean the whole thing, you know, I said, I mean the, the surgery, the, 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 the doctor's part of it, uh, the medicine, the hospital time, you know, the whole bit. I'm, I'm asking for the whole thing. I thought they had just given me a part of something there. So they talked a little bit and he said, no, no, that's it. The whole thing. And I said, so you're telling me for $350, this man can take his wife to the hospital, get a hysterectomy, uh, get the follow-up care she needs, get the doctor paid and the medicine. And, and, and if, if indeed she's ahead of this disease, um, that her life could be saved for $350. And, and my friend said, yeah, that's, that's what he's saying. And uh, he said, but, but Paul, you need to understand for him, $350 could be $350,000. He doesn't, he doesn't have, he doesn't have $350. You know, he doesn't have 350 solace, you know, which would be a fraction of that. And so that's really at that point where I said, wait, 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 wait. And I told him then, and I remember the exact words I said, I said, uh, tell him 
that I don't have $350 laying under every rock at home, but I do have $350 if it'll save the life of his wife. And, and it was like, um, like I ran over the guy with the freight train. You know, he, it's like the, the strength left his legs. He turned pale. He, he, he was not believing what he was hearing me say. And he really, 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 you would pay for the, the, the surgery of my wife. And I said, absolutely. I mean, if, unless there's something you guys aren't telling me, if this is really what the case is, I, I can pay for the surgery. And uh, long story short is we did. And, and the lady uh, had a successful surgery and a successful outcome. And this has been 15 years ago, but to my, to my knowledge, she's still alive and well today. And we've repeated that process now many, many times. But that was the first time. And that was the time that, that really set the hook for me that, that was a profound, profound moment where I thought, man, 350 bucks, you know, to save somebody's life, um, you know, this is a worth that I can do. I certainly didn't have the money in the States to pay for somebody's surgery. I mean, you know, you, you can't go to a yeah. urgent care center to get three stitches for that kind of money, you know? No. And so, uh, but I said, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, then that I'm sure that there are people here in Peru that I can help even on my income. I mean, we had a logging company and a car business and certainly had everything that my family needed. We had a lot of what I wanted, but we were never, you know, rich in any category. Uh, we just were, were living a good life in, in the U.S., land of opportunity, working hard, getting up and going to work every day, providing for my family. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I realized at that moment that there was something I could do in a country where my U.S. dollar was going to get leveraged against a much weaker economy. And, um, and so that's really what started it. So I came back. Then in 2001, did that same thing, gathered up about 120 patients, took them to a private hospital, paid for their pharmaceuticals, their surgeries, their exams, their, you know, just whatever they needed, dental work. Um, they brought in physicians from all over the city because they all of a sudden had, you know, within three days, they had 120 patients there and, and <laughs> had clogged up the system a bit, but it was yeah. great. And at the end of 10 days, we had everybody taken care of. And, and it was, uh, again, like I said before, it was a no-brainer. I mean, I, I literally packed up my suitcase, got in the plane, and left. And there was nothing to worry about, to wonder about, or to follow up on, or to you – know, no, no schemes or scams or people taking advantage. Just a lot of people that uh, whose lives have been impacted, not just them, but their families, their husbands and wives, their children, whoever, you know, whatever the case was. Uh, so it was really a, a compound effect. Um, that was – that was 2001 and 2002 came back, uh, same thing, about 150 patients, but something very profound happened on that trip that night. I had been late at night feeding street children, uh, finished up in a local restaurant about midnight, sending these kids off to wherever it is they were supposed to be at that hour of the night with no adult supervision. And as I was walking across the plaza on the way home, a little a uh, girl came out of nowhere. I didn't see her coming, and she uh, tugged on my on my shirt tail. And I was with a translator because, again, this was the very beginning. I didn't speak Spanish, and so I'll just give you this conversation in English. But it all was going through a, a young translator friend of mine named Freddie, and she said, "Hey, Mister, do you have some coins for me?" And I said, trying to throw her off her hustle game a little bit out there, you know, because they're going after the tourists for money and. And I said, hey, didn't your mom tell you that it's not polite to beg? And she never missed a breath. And she said, well, uh, I don't have a mom. And I said, oh, of course. You know, I said to Freddie, of course she'd say that because parents tell these little kids to tell people they don't have parents because then they'll get better you know, at, you know, at the begging game and people will be more generous. Yeah. So I was trying to throw her off her game again. And I said, well, if your mom, um, if, you're, you know, if you don't have a mom, then you should probably go home and live with me. And she never missed a breath again. And she said, oh, no, 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 mister. You know, she wagged her finger at me, did the old Peruvian finger wag. And she said, hey, uh, no, mister. The last thing my mom told me before she died was don't go home to strangers. And um, Freddie and I started to laugh. I thought, man, this kid is witty. You know, I'm trying to throw her off her game, but she's got an answer for me. And so um, I, uh, I, you know, I thought, okay, you know what? So we were laughing kind of, and, and, and when I looked back down at her, she had tears forming in the corner of her eyes, 
and her chin was quivering. And I looked at Freddie and said, Oh no, man, you know, we both just, we both knew at the same time that we had just laughed at this little girl who had just told us that her mom had died. And so that was a really sobering moment. I remember Freddie taking her hands and kneeling down on the sidewalk in front of her. She was eight years old. And we started asking her questions. And when I said, well, where do you live? And she, she shrugged and, and held her hands out to her side. And she said, you know, like right here. I said, no, 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 honey, where do you sleep at night? Where do you, where do you go in the nighttime? And she said, right here. I said, but who's here taking care of you? And she said, well, nobody. And I asked her two or three times, who's here taking care of you? Who are you with? And she said, well, yeah, my sister, my sister. And I thought, oh, thank God. You know, I, I expected some teenager to come walking around the corner at any moment and um, rescue, you know, this little kid from being alone in the middle of the night on the streets. And uh, by this time, the kids that we had just finished feeding in the restaurant had seen us talking to someone. They sprinted across the plaza and caught up with us. There was an older boy in the group, and I asked him the same thing. Does this little girl have uh, a family? And he said, no, her mom died. And I said, how long ago? And he said, oh, I don't know, a couple years. So I asked this little girl, how long you been alone? And she said, a couple years. Where's your sister? Oh, she's here somewhere. So I said to one of these kids, go find, go find this little girl's sister. So within a few minutes, here came the other one. And I was expecting a teenager, somebody that was old enough to be responsible. And, the, and her sister was 10 years old. So these little guys, you know, they'd been out there since they were six and eight, two years on the street, panhandling, begging, sleeping in the bushes, underneath the park benches, uh, doing whatever they needed to do to survive. And now here I was in the middle of the night in an Amazon jungle city with these two little kids with the full knowledge that they were out there by themselves. And, and I, I couldn't take them anywhere with me that night. You know, that's, uh, I'm an American man. People knew who I was. You can't just pick up two little girls in the middle of the night, and take them with you. Uh, a lot of, a lot of bad stuff like that goes on in, in these types of cities. And so I knew that I'd have to bribe them or something. And I did, I said, if you come back here tomorrow morning, I'll buy you some tennis shoes. Long story short is that, uh, I had a little contingency of a little uh, group of um, Peruvians that I brought back with me the next day. Uh, they took these little girls to their community, verified that story with the neighbors that had known their mom. Uh, within a few hours, they were back. And, uh, I stayed there. They, they said, better if you don't go. They don't need to see somebody from North America asking a lot of questions about these two little kids. So they came back a few hours later, verified that everything the girls had told us that night was true. So on that trip, I bought a simple house, um, moved that Peruvian family into that home, and they took care of the girls for about a year and a half until I got down there full time. And that was the, uh, you know, that was that was one of the final uh, kind of the final hooks that that was set. I'm uh, very relationally oriented. Now I had these two little kids that I knew, uh, knew their names, I knew their circumstances. I, I was supporting them through this other family. And I just knew that it was something I was going to do. And I wrote a letter that night, late that night, wrote an email out that said, now I know what the missing piece is of the work I want to do here in Peru. I want to buy or build a home for little girls like the ones I found on the street tonight who have nowhere else to go. And a few weeks after I got home, I got a phone call from one of the heirs of the Little Debbie Foundation, the, the snack cake world's largest privately owned bakery there yeah. outside of Chattanooga. And um, she read me back uh, that short paragraph on my email that I had sent out to my wife and to my mom. And they had forwarded it to friends and friends had sent it to friends and friends had sent it to friends until finally it ended up in the hands of, um, of one of the McKee girls. And um, she said to me back then, uh, you know, so what's it going to take to make this happen? And I, and we had a conversation and she said, when you're ready, just let me know. So it took a little while to get out of business, to get my, my finances in order, to get uh, my obligations taken care of. We sold both of our homes. I sold my commercial property, uh, sold the, the land that we were living in, 40 acres up on the mountains north of Spokane, our horses, our toys, our equipment. You know, this was something that we were so compelled to do that we never, ever looked back, never had a regret. And a lot of the things that we thought we were giving up on a, a 
on a permanent basis, like take motorcycles, for instance, I thought when I sold all my bikes and stuff, I thought, well, okay, that's, that's it. You know, my riding days are now finished at the age of 42, but I can tell you uh, good things happen in one way or another when you really, really do what you're compelled to do. And, uh, you know, in the case of the motorcycles, I ride more now than I ever have in my life because now it's all work related. Yeah. Travel to the U.S. and Canada uh, on my speaking tours, raising awareness, raising money, raising volunteer groups for our organization, as well as, um, you know, taking these fundraising trips like you and I just finished with up in the Andes. Um, you know, that's something that I thought I was giving up for for the greater good of humanity. And here it came around full circle. And I've been blessed to, to do something that I'm passionate about while doing something that I'm passionate about. So yeah. that's, that's how that works. That's awesome. Uh, you were telling me about, um, well, I want to know, well, I want everybody else to know more about um, your facility there. You've got student housing. Yes. Um, okay. And then you've also, uh, you've got people on staff now that have been with you uh, so long that they, at one point they were living with you. Uh, yes. Yeah, I guess let's just dig into that a little bit. Um, one of the advantages of being some place uh, as long as I have now, really 18 years from the very beginning, 14 years full time, is that you you know you're you're blessed in my position to be able to see kind of some of the fruition of your work now. We've planted lots of seeds with thousands of people. We've given free medical and dental work to over 60,000 people now. So that ripple effect has gone well beyond, you know, anything that will be measurable by, by us anyway. But uh, you get those stories, you know, when people come back and they talk about how their life was changed, uh, had a contractor that was actually working on one of our buildings who we had given a free surgery to five or six years prior. And I didn't know who he was at the time. And, all, and he had worked for us quite a bit. And I didn't know that we had done a surgery for him until one day we were, we had all the materials to finish uh, the wall portion of one of our dormitory buildings out of our girls facility. But I, I really didn't have the money for the labor for the last probably day and a half work that we needed to do in order just to kind of button up that building and be, and be kind of finished with a clean phase of it. You know, we, we're like a lot of other people in Peru. And since we're donation based, we, we, you know, we build and develop as we go. And I just wanted to get the brickwork done on this building and, and be done with that phase. And then we'd stop and raise some money to keep, keep going. So they let me know that they were out of budget and uh, out of money. So I went out there and I said, oh, guys, you know, please, you, you've been working for us for several months uninterrupted. We've paid you well. We've tried to take good care of you. Uh, I'm just begging you, you know, uh, could you could you just hang in here just another day and a half or so? Just get this block work done. So this phase is finished and kind of making my plea. Mm -hmm. And it was just something like you'd see out of a movie. Um, the maestro, this little man. Uh, stepped forward and he said, listen, uh, he said to his crew, he was talking to his crew, had about six guys there. And he said, years ago, when Mr. Paul first came here, he did a surgery for me uh, on, a, on a hernia, uh, a bad hernia. He said, you know, I hadn't been working because I couldn't lift anything. I couldn't do anything. And and so my, my work days were done. My family was suffering and he was kind of describing his situation. He said, but but Paul came and did a surgery for me, and that changed, you know, my life and, and impacted my family. Within some months, I went back to work, and I've been working ever since. And now we've worked out here for all these months on this building. And he said, I, for one, am going to stay and get this uh, wall done, you know, with or without being paid. And it was, like I said, it was something like you'd see out of a movie, you know, then one at a time, they all kind of looked at each other, and one guy steps forward, okay, me too, me too, me too. And those guys stayed, and in, in less than a day and a half, they had that project done, and, um, you know, until we could stop, raise the money to keep going and, and finish our building. But just a really neat thing, and that was an absolute surprise for me. This guy had worked for us for quite a while, and I didn't know. Because in the beginning, when we were helping people, I, you know, I didn't know these people. We just knew here's a man that somebody brought to us or a name that was suggested to us. Here's a man that couldn't work anymore because he needed a, a hernia operation. And uh, so that was just a neat uh, example of kind of what goes around comes around. And he stepped up and helped finish that job. But what we have now is a, um, 
crisis center for abandoned and abused girls. So all of those girls that are with us have either been physically or sexually abused, or they have been abandoned, or they're with us because of extreme poverty and hardship. And there's just, let's say uh, their dad never was, mom died, and now grandma's raising them and their three siblings. And grandma comes and says, look, I've barely been struggling through to, to keep these guys fed while they're in elementary school, but now the oldest one's going off to high school. I don't have the resources for that. I really, really need some help. I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this by myself or something changes or she gets sick or who knows. So <clears throat> it can be extreme poverty, uh, physical abuse, uh, protective custody, uh, where the judge will bring a child to us who's court case is still pending somewhere and they want to take her out of harm's way in the community because oftentimes the perpetrator lives in the community and has a lot more power and resources than the than the family of the of the victim and so uh, for their own good they need to um, uh, put them somewhere that's safe and neutral so we have children in that classification too on our main campus we have a dormitory that was uh, purchased specifically for our university students because the university is only a mile away. And we've got kids now, students that came to us, uh, all impoverished people, all people that would have not gone on to school beyond their high school years. And um, who are now, for example, we've graduated three dentists, one of which uh, was a little boy I met down in the slums when he was seven years old. And now he's not only a dentist, but he's leading our dental program. We have a beautiful dental operative that's part of a, a 8,000 square foot building that we're renovating as we speak, as we raise the money, we're speaking, uh, as we speak to uh, renovate this building for a surgery center mm-hmm. that will be complete with two operatives, uh, an eye surgery center for cataracts, um, prenatal care, and an OB. Uh, we want to have uh, crisis intervention counseling services for, for families that have been traumatized, for children that have been traumatized. Uh, it's going to be a legal uh, center. You know, we'll have some legal representation for, for impoverished folks that are being taken advantage of because they have no resources. So this is a fabulous, fabulous uh, 8,000 square foot facility that literally butts up against our property line. We shared we shared some of the walls. So their exterior wall was our interior wall. So couldn't have been more perfect. We feel very fortunate. I raised money for a year to purchase that facility. Uh, we purchased it last February. Now we're in the new the new phase of fundraising to get the money together to, uh, to put a state-of-the-art surgery center that will always be free for impoverished people. We've had volunteers from all over the world that have already come. We did over 100 surgeries in our little clinic that we had for eight years, uh, but we lost that facility because the airport is expanding their runways and they annex part of that community. So we knew we had to move, but yeah. the beauty of it is you only have one chance in a lifetime usually to buy to buy the building right next door to you. So the, the, the timing was perfect. Uh, definitely another stroke of divine intervention from my perspective. And now uh, we don't even have to go out of our front door to get to the building next door. We, we put an entrance to the side of this building directly from our campus, directly to the food service area. It's very, very nice. And uh, we're, we look forward to some great things. We've got a lot of um, a lot of institutions that have come alongside of us. Uh, Washington State University School of Nursing, uh, Pharmacy, and Physical Therapy has been to our project 13 years in a row now as part of their international studies program. Students getting academic credit faculty leading the charge. Uh, it has been amazing. Every year they come, they treat between 700 and 1,000 patients uh, in the poor communities around the city and up and down the Amazon. It's, it's been amazing. Uh, Union College uh, brings their PA students now. I think this was their 11th year that they just finished. Wright State University, their medical students. Uh, Kettering Hospital in Ohio, their, their uh, medical students. Wimbledon University has been there multiple times. We've got a lot of institutions that have come alongside of us now and seen they've seen the value in bringing their medical practitioners uh, to, to come alongside us and do the work that, of course, we're not equipped to do, but we're equipped to host other people that are equipped to do it. Yeah. And that's what we do. Um, the very first child that I ever helped 
in Iquitos, Peru, came from the slums called Belen. And you can you can YouTube this or Google it somewhere. B L B E L E N Belen, Iquitos, Peru. It's the slums outside the city. Uh, the poorest of the poor live there. It's a dangerous place at night. It's um, it's a very difficult environment because the waters of the Amazon will will rise and uh, and lower. Uh, by 20 to 40 feet a year. So the open sewage ditches that have accumulated human waste for nine months out of the year will then be covered with, uh, with this water that comes in and it just floats that up into the, uh, into the basements, the lower levels of all the homes and the businesses and, and everything and that turns it into Venice, if you will. And then for three or four months out of the year, they have to uh, suffer with that water. But the children still swim in it. The ladies still wash their clothes in it. Uh, they bathe in it, and the uh, the bacterial uh, impact of that contaminated water is is horrific in that community, with um, infant mortality uh, and all of the uh, bacterial issues uh, in the guts. Now, when the water goes down and things begin to dry out, and the vehicles start running down there again, then of course all of that mud, contaminated mud, turns to dust, and that dust goes into the air. And then you have that same sort of bacterial uh, issue, but this time it's it's directed toward the lungs. So we have a lot of a lot of issues in the rest of the year in terms of that. So in that community, um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of kids that really need an opportunity for some help. The very first child in March of 2000 that I ever knew in Peru. In other words, a, a face of a child that was not just a face in the crowd, but somebody that I actually recognized, even though I didn't know her name, didn't have any idea who she was or where she lived, but I knew who she was because her uh, because she hung around with my daughter every night uh, after these big meetings that they had in the Coliseum. So I would always see her with my daughter, and that's how I knew who she was, and that's all I knew about her, was that she was my daughter's friend. And a long, beautiful story that maybe I can tell some other time. But um, I, I looked for her the next year when I came back in 2001. And I had pictures of her in my pocket of her and my daughter together. And I looked and looked and looked. And 10 days into the trip, just a couple days before I was coming home, um, I, I found her. Again, an amazing story down in Lower Berlin. Nobody seemed to know her. Uh, but there she was standing right in the middle of the street looking at me as I, as I walk toward them. And just, uh, again, it's a whole story all to itself. So I won't take the time here, but this very first child that I ever really, really knew then in, in, um, Iquitos, uh, her family was right there. I met her mom and dad. I met her little brother who I've already referenced. He's, uh, he's our dentist and in charge of her dental program. Um, we uh, got to know each other. I started assisting where I could came back the next year, Put her, helped her finish in high school that year. The next year came back, put her in language school and then computer school. And then after a year or so, I said, man, why aren't you studying beyond this? And she said, oh, you know, I have no, she could speak within four or five months in language school. She was bilingual. And now she was helping me translate when I was running around trying to help people and got this friendship with her and the family. It was very, very nice. She was 13 when I met her. And uh, so by 16, I'm wondering why she's not in the university. And again, she gave me the old, you're a unicorn look, you know, as when I asked her why she wasn't in the university, because it takes money and she didn't have any money. She was working to pay for her own food um, and her own necessities and, you know, was pretty well destined to embrace that as her life. But uh, I convinced her that she could go to the university and that we would help her do that. She was our first student that we sponsored. Um, she went all the way through the university, got a degree in child psychology, and now she is the executive director of our organization. So the very, very first kid I ever helped in Peru is now running the show, which is what makes it possible for me to be here. Now, the two little girls that I told you about earlier that I met in the plaza, uh, they were a year and a half with that family before I got down there full time. As soon as I got there, I got custody of the girls, started the adoption process. I had my residency in Peru, so I adopted them through the court system, a judicial adoption, not a not a agency-to-agency uh, -agency adoption from one country to another, but I actually adopted them as a Peruvian resident. 
uh, raised them there for 10 years full time. I lived in Peru for 10 years full time while I was building the organization and raising these kids. And uh, my deal with them was, of course, they wanted to come home and be with mom at, at our home in the States. You know, and I said, no, 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 no. If I'm down here trying to uh, impact your world, then you're going to stay here and, and, and help me do it. And so my deal with them was uh, when the youngest one is finished with high school, then you can go live in, in our home in the States. And then, um, by that time we had uh, moved, we'd got some sponsorship in Southern Idaho. We had sold everything we had up in Washington, got some sponsorship with a uh, real estate development company, by the way. And um, he ended up paying my salary for three years to make it possible for this transition to happen from full-time employment into this, you know, essentially full-time charity work. Uh, he hired my wife as the ex as an executive secretary and office management person there. And so that's how we were able to sustain our family as we uh, begin growing this organization. And so that was a huge blessing again in and of itself. But uh, when the girls finished high school after 10 years there, uh, then they came back to the States. Uh, they've been in the States now for over six years. They're both married, both have kids. One, The youngest one lives in Portland. The oldest one still lives down in the Boise area. And, of course, they have uh, two of my grandchildren, which is very special. Yeah. But uh, So they're here now, and, uh, and the timing was just right because when the, by the time the kids left Peru and I was no longer really on daddy duty down there, then I became uh, free to come and go, uh, and, uh, and our executive director, uh, is, you know, has been running the show there, uh, ever since. And, uh, now, now I'm there about five months out of the year, six months out of the year. And the rest of the time I'm here in the States, traveling, speaking, motivating other people to, to, uh, embrace, you know, the, the passion that's been put on, on them or to embrace, embrace the, uh, uh, you know, the compulsion that's been put on them to do something, whether it's for your own family, whether it's for your, your business, your associates, whether, you know, just whatever it is that, that you have the passion to do, I'm really uh, traveling and encouraging people to embrace that and to, and to go all in. I mean, just to go all in and, and I can tell my story, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we're looking for our volunteers, our volunteer groups, and then obviously, raising the money that it takes to support that organization. Now with 14 full-time employees, full-time medical program, full-time dental program, our crisis center for abandoned and abused girls, which we, which we did build. And now the development of the surgery center and the, the kids uh, that have gone through the university have been amazing. A little girl that came to us at 12 years old to our crisis center is now the director of our crisis center. She's a nurse. She's married. She has a three-year-old son now. I mean, sorry, three-year-old, three-month-old son now. And, uh, and it's, it's gratifying to see a little child that comes to you as, a, as an abandoned, broken child to, to now be a 26-year-old, uh, confident, uh, professional woman with a husband and a child who are, you know, impacting now the lives of other little kids that are, have come in the same same way. So we've graduated those uh, dentists. We've got a doctor, a uh, female young woman that's finishing up her, um, her internship this year. She'll be a physician, a uh, teacher that we put through school who's been teaching for us now. She taught for us for seven years. A lawyer that's been practicing for about five, six years, a mechanical engineer, uh, our psychologist, our dentist. Uh, you know, it's really been uh, amazing. And then, of course, not every girl that comes to us has an interest or the aptitude to go on to the university. So we've graduated lots of kids from high school that have gone on to do some vocational training things or some technical job or have just said, hey, thanks so much. I came to you guys in a real difficult place in my life, but things are good now. I'm going to go home. I want to rejoin my community, rejoin my family and, and uh, rejoin my, my previous life. So you know, every story is different for every child. There are stories that are too horrible to tell uh, in public, things that happen to little kids uh, at the hands of perpetrators. And so, you know, some of those stories are just absolutely overwhelming. And, uh, you know, but our job and the job of the thousands of volunteers that come every year is to be the glue that, that pieces the, the parts of these little kids back together. And it's, it's truly inspiring to me to see the resilience and the strength 
of children who've been damaged badly, who have bounced back and embraced the opportunity that they've been given um, because of the financial supporters at home and because of the volunteers that come and just impact their lives. So, you know, Brandon, there's there's <laughs> there's 18 years worth <laughs> yeah. wrapped up you know, wrapped up in in less than an hour. And as you know, having spent the last 10 days together, that I could I could tell stories all day long and and, and not run out and we get tired of doing so. But um, you know, I, I just appreciate this opportunity. If there's any other questions you have, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if, if any of your listeners have questions, of course, I'm happy to, to field those questions as well. And um, more than more than willing to answer emails or phone calls and talk about what people's involvement might be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people ask me all the time, Hey man, Paul, you know, do you want my money or do you want me to come down and volunteer? And, and I say, I want your life to be impacted. That's what I want. And, and I encourage people to come and to see what we do, to see how we do it and where we do it. The kind of relationship we have with the people in the community, the kind of relationship we have with the kids that we're educating and, and, you know, if people will come and invest themselves into the lives of kids and people say, well, you know, hey, come on, I'm not a, I'm not a gifted speaker. I'm not a physician. I'm not a dentist. I'm, you know, I'm not a pastor. I, you know, what the heck can I do if I come down there? I, I'll be like a, you know, a duck out of water. What am I going to do in the Amazon jungle of Peru? Listen, we have, we have a uh, simple maintenance and, and painting and construction things that can be done. Fortunately, we've had everybody from master plumbers and, uh, you know, electricians and contractors, people that can come and really do things. So there's things along those lines. But, you know, I always ask people, so can you, you know, can you play volleyball or soccer with kids? You know, can you can you sit on the sidewalk and, and do uh, chalk art on the sidewalk with a four year old? I, most of us can, you know. Um, can you, can you just sit and listen to their stories and ask them questions? Can you, can you hug a kid that's feeling a little bit lonely or vulnerable at that time? You know, there's tons of things that you can do. We've never, we've had people there from every walk of life, every cultural background. We've had people with all kinds of physical limitations. We've had volunteers that have come in wheelchairs. We've had people that, you know, we had a girl that came a few years ago that had cerebral palsy so, so badly that she could hardly walk. But she was a huge blessing to those kids as she told her story. You know, we've had people come in. Uh, I had a man that came that was stone blind and did everything that everybody else did. It was a huge blessing as he shared uh, some of the struggles in his own life that he overcome. So, you know, whether whether you've got limitations or just lack a lot of abilities or whether you're talented, you know, uh, from from top to bottom, uh, I believe we can use you. We're a full service organization. I mean, we have everything from our own vehicles that need to be serviced and maintained to children that just need to be loved on and listened to and, and cared for and, uh, and a lot of stuff in between. So, yes, we love volunteers. And then I believe, to be transparent, that once people come, they invest, they see what we do, how we do it, where we do it, then uh, then if you're so compelled to, to support us financially, fantastic. Now, you know, some of you are saying, oh, well, um, I'd love to give, but if, if coming is a prerequisite, that's never going to happen. No, we'll, we'll, we'll bypass that requirement. Right. <laughs> there are people that are looking for a good um, 501c3 uh, charitable organization to give to. I, I want to encourage you to check us out. Um, we're transparent. Uh, my wife and I make teachers' salaries. There's no CEOs here knocking down millions. Trust me. Um, we've got a lot of work we want to do, and we're, we're looking for every way that we can do it more effectively, more efficiently, and, and, and responsibly with the monies that we've been trusted with. So uh, we welcome scrutiny. And, um, and you know, but again, the, the volunteers are the lifeblood of what we do. So um, if you can come, come. And if you can just support us from afar, then thank God for, for that group too, because we certainly need the help. Uh, I did have one question and my mom brought this up uh, cause we got to talking about um, how she's a registered nurse. Um, uh, and, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to be asking this properly, but so her being licensed and registered here in the United States, can she do nursing or nurse activity down there in Peru without having to uh, any prerequisite 
prerequisite uh, filings or classes or anything? Can she just go down there and help with her abilities? Yes. Um, so we just ask all the medical providers to bring just a copy of their of their current license, so nursing license or, or license to practice medicine or dentistry or whatever it is. Um, in all of the years that we've had medical teams that have come, mm-hmm. we, we've never had anybody from the Minister of Health request to see those things, but everybody should have it with them anyway because it yeah. would happen. <clears throat> but we've given over, you know, we've given free medical and dental care to over 60,000 people in the city. Everybody knows who we are. We've worked with lots of, uh, we've done um, campaigns, medical campaigns together with the with the Minister of Health programs, with other medical uh, entities from the government, uh, other government campaigns uh, where we've provided services or medicines or both. So um, yeah, we've we've got a really really good working relationship with uh, with the medical authorities in our city, and they just ask that we have copies of our uh, current licenses to practice in the U.S. And if we've got that, then they know that the competencies that our medical practitioners come with are you know are are likely much much higher, much much stricter, and our protocols are much uh, more refined or defined uh, than the local medical community. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's the answer is uh, they don't need to do anything other than bring a copy. Okay. Um, and then I was thinking about your surgery center while you're doing that and how you're in the middle of building that. Um, like I was telling you before, a lot of my audience is primarily up and coming entrepreneurs or somebody in the real estate world, but I do have, I don't know, a few dozen doctors and um, physicians and even a couple uh, anesthesiologists. How can people like that help you in that department, if at all? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> there are times when a group says, hey, we're coming down from a school. What can we do, for example? And, and, and I say, well, let's turn that around. Let's say, what are your what's your skill set? And they say, okay, well, we've got we got a couple of the uh, faculty and two of the fathers that are coming along and, and a bunch of the a bunch of the students, they really want to build something. Okay. And then they say, but then we've got some other teachers and some of the students that really like to do some children's programming. And that's, that's perfect. We, we always have need for that. But then somebody will say, but you know, I've got a doctor and a dentist and two nurses. Is that enough? Is that enough medical personnel to do medical clinics? And so, Sometimes we'll get a little poor group of a, of a medical team that, that really would have a hard time doing a campaign all by themselves. And so at that time, I'm looking for medical practitioners that aren't necessarily associated with another group that said, man, I'd love to come sometime. When would be a good time to come? And then I can match them up with groups that have a, a medical interest and a medical component, but maybe not enough medical practitioners to do a real public thing. And so we have doctors, dentists, and nurses joining other groups that are either full medical groups or that are groups that have a medical component that's not quite big enough to stand on their own. So it's just a matter of somebody contacting me and saying, hey, I'd love to come. Uh, this time of year would be better than that. Um, is there any, is there any medical team that you could plug me in with? Mm-hmm. And then we could just go from there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Or they could just get a bunch of their friends together and have their own complete medical program, you know, cause we have our, our medical director, we have, uh, all the pharmaceuticals available to us in our city and, uh, you know, we've got that too. So it's not like they have to come and figure it all out from scratch. We've done, we've, we've done hundreds and hundreds of medical campaigns. And so we've got a pretty nice process and, uh, you know, we just welcome the, the U S medical practitioners to come and join us. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, let you go here. Uh, I'll leave it with uh, which, how can we all reach out to you? And I'll put everything down in the notes down below, but um uh, I know we got the people of Peru.org, correct? Yes. And um, and a lot of that contact information is on there. Is there anything else outside of that web 
we can visit to get a hold of you guys? Yeah, People of Peru Project, all four words on Facebook is, uh, you know, Facebook tends to be the more <clears throat> the more current, uh, updated information. Peopleofperu.org is our website, and I will confess that uh, we are just steps away from doing a complete renovation of our website. It's it's antiquated. Uh, it's difficult to manipulate from from the slow internet speeds in Peru, and it has fallen behind a little bit. There's some really really good static information there. Uh, there's uh, some some stories there that I've written over the years. There's a lot of there's a lot of good information there. But uh, for for those of you tech savvy people that that go to the website and say, "Wow, do they need a facelift?" We know. Yeah. We know we do, and and we're we're working toward that. That's part of my goal here in this next couple of months. Well, I need to get that, that upgraded. But Facebook uh, is kind of where we post the current things. It's just you know it's so easy to to get little snippets and videos and pictures uploaded there. So uh, you know you know if you go there right now, the last few things posted will be on that benefit ride that we just finished. But if you scroll back, you'll see all the volunteers that we had this last uh, season. So that's a great way to uh, just really get a flavor, the hundreds, if not thousands of pictures. Great, great way to get a sense of kind of uh, of the geography, the people, the culture, the work we do. And then, of course, uh, my email, which is the letter U, the number four, Peru, P-E-R-U, U4Peru at gmail.com. Uh, is is the absolute most sure way to get a hold of me. I mean, I answer my phone when I hear it, um, but if if I if I have to be away from the phone, but uh, you for Peru at Gmail is is my email, and I I'm I'm very good about responding uh, to emails quickly. And then uh, uh, my phone, which is also publicly posted there, area code five zero nine 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 nine. 6353 and uh, you can you know always give me a call and uh, you know there's lots and lots of ways to get a hold of us but uh, uh, emails are very sure and uh, you can check out our progress on Facebook or the web or the website so uh, some good contact information for you yeah, I appreciate it I'll have it all up and hopefully we can get you some more people out there uh, I'm really excited to bring the girls out and hope that I can get my mom to come out with me as well and uh, Absolutely. I yeah, I can't wait to bring up, bring yeah. them all out there. It's going to be good. Well, thanks so much for this opportunity for your for your listening audience. Um, you know, I, I admire uh, the kind of people that you're speaking with out there because I I had a sense of of that while we were um, traveling together and the kind of entrepreneurial, don't take no for an answer kind of person that sees a goal or sees a need ahead of them and says, you know, let's make this thing happen. And uh, you and I both know people, we have known people and we'll know people our entire life who will wish their life away. You know, they'll be saying, oh, I wish I could do this. I've always wanted to do that. Or man, wouldn't that be nice? But you and I know that uh, wishing doesn't get you anything. Right. That, that there's that certain percentage of person who is going to stand up, put one foot in front of the other, get some momentum going maybe when they're not even clear as to what they're doing or where they're headed, but that momentum starts to take shape and starts to take focus. And before long, you've got people doing some amazing things. And so um, that's, that's the audience that I know I'm talking to, which is, which is very exciting for me. Awesome, Paul. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Look thanks, forward, Paul. Look, look forward to hearing from you again. All righty.